from the southeast back to Nevada. I was off on another adventure, ready to continue the journey through the ancient lands of America. I was on the way to Nevada, but the journey would take place in California as well, all around the Lake of Tahoe. I had heard stories of this lake and the lands around it, this great expanse, the people who were lost within it. Their histories come to mind and the legends behind them. Those of struggle and tales of giants to the east, I was captivated by this new world to me. Crossing through the deserts of barrenness, finally seeing Lake Tahoe, I wanted to tell the people of old, you need only go a little further, for great abundance awaits you, the mountains guarding it like a wall. After touching down in Reno, Nevada, I would meet up with Amelia, who had come here on a student work program all the way from Thailand. You're always yawning when I record. We also got Amelia with us again. I can't, I can't believe it. All the way from Thailand. Is that right? Or was it Malaysia? Where, where you? Thailand. So we just left Reno, Nevada. We're heading up towards the city of Fallon. Outside of the city, there's a small cave known as Hidden Cave. To reach, you have to go through a tour group. So this is luckily one of the days where we can access that tour. So we're going up to the Churchill Museum where we'll leave to check out the cave. This is just one of the sites in the lost world of America. In pursuit of this lost world, we'll cross the modern one, searching for the sites and stories left behind. To cross worlds, to me, means to explore other cultures, histories, and countries. We'll have to go back in time to find many of these worlds, but it's a quest I will not stop. So this whole area was underneath the Lake Lahontan. After about 10,000 years, this area would start to recede, leaving this hidden cave exposed for the Native American people to not inhabit, but they would use it as a cache site to store goods, and they would camp out around the surrounding area. So these petroglyphs right here, these are thought to date at about 1 AD to 1500 AD. So not quite as old as some of the sites we'll see, but still old enough. Poor old lovers, and this was underwater. Native Americans would have just taken shelter in this area. That's the cave over there. It's got a sealed door on it. So this was essentially a storehouse for the Tayutakata people, or their ancestors, various people over the years. 
they would store all sorts of resources as they came in hunting in the area. It's not believed they settled here too much, but it was a very prosperous piece of land about 2,000 years ago, right around this cave. So you can see this area where archaeologists dug out the cave portion. This hasn't been done since the 80s, but you can see their work. He'd been uncovering a layer of ash coming all the way from Oregon after the great eruption of Mount Mazama 7,700 years ago. This eruption shattered the mountain. The ash filled the air. I can only imagine the great catastrophe this was. It was the largest eruption in a million years for the region. There was some graffiti written in here in 2014. Some people broke in. So they got to keep it protected. Thank you. Thank Appreciate you so it. much. No problem. Bye. 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 See you, man. I think they all closed it. Okay, how do you feel? I feel good. <laughs> I feel thirsty because we were so smart as to not bring water. How does it smell in the cave? It smells great. No. It has the smell of old bat poop. Yeah. Sort of the ammonia smell in there. Yeah, but it's pretty fun. Yeah. Should we walk down that way? Yes. <laughs> so this is a unrelated tour. We're being led by some kids to the Bird's Cave, is what it's called, not too far from here. There were some petroglyphs, they say, but actually I'm noticing pictographs, some of the Native American paintings. Unfortunately, they've been vandalized, um, which is the case for a lot of these carvings and paintings. For whatever reason, people want to destroy them. Um, but you can see some of them here. I don't know what these lines are here, but if I had to guess, some sort of snake or just a pattern of some sort. This almost looks like the outline of a bird here. This one is all destroyed. It's hard to know what that ever was. One thing's for certain, that's Quan Cao. And I don't know why she's all the way over here instead of in Thailand. How did she get here? <laughs> so archeologists tend to believe that these caves were only inhabited occasionally for hunting or ceremonial purposes in the surrounding areas. Apparently it just wasn't an abundant place for resources. To my knowledge, archeologists have basically just not found the typical discoveries you'd find in settlements and other campsites. They've only found some tools and things like that. But we're leaving the area now. There's some petroglyphs up further ahead. We'll check out and then we'll finally get water. Water. <laughs> yeah, finally. Don't be like us. Come prepared. I was so worried about getting all my equipment together that I fought, forgot the most important thing. So, hopefully we'll make it back. What do you think, Conco? Finally. Finally. Water. So approaching now, not far from the hidden cave, Su'u, which means basalt rock in the Paiute Shoshone language. The people that carved these petroglyphs were known as the Toy Takata people, if I'm saying that correctly. In their language, it meant cactail eaters. See that one there? 
as long as it's over here. It's the sort of line pattern again. And we can see some sort of plant is what that looks like. See some more here. It's a sort of human like figure. So no one really knows what these petroglyphs mean exactly. One of the theories brought up mainly in the 50s was the idea of them being hunting magic petroglyphs. So they would come to certain areas, carve the petroglyphs in hopes of a higher power or something of the earth helping the Native American people in their hunting. rock facing on here is odd. See how it sort of cuts off and has all these markings on there. I don't I don't know what that is. Strange. So I'm told here these are almost 7,000 years old. These peckings in the stone. probably one of the oldest ones. The interior of the rock is much more faded. So that was the hidden cave and the petroglyphs surrounding it. We'll be heading on to Lovelock Cave next, the mythical cave of giants. Follow along as we continue this journey. So Lovelock Cave, what's different about this cave to any other cave you maybe hear about? Well, I'll tell you. I'll tell you, Amelia, because you asked that question. Okay. In 1887, a young man by the name of John Reed set off to catch wild horses with some local Paiutes of the Carson and Humboldt Sinks. They would make camp at Lovelock Cave. Later, Captain Natchez related to me the great calamity which had occurred in the cave to another race of people who had been exterminated by the Paiutes. Captain Natchez was the Paiute leader of this party. He and the others would go on to describe this exterminated race as red-headed and speakers of their same language. Years before, in 1883, Natchez's sister, Sarah Winnemucca, described them as cannibals. The Lovelock Paiute tribe of today leaves out the word giant once again but describes these cannibals as very tall and having red hair all over their bodies. John Reed would grow up to become a mining engineer and an avid amateur anthropologist, unearthing artifacts and so-called giant bones from the area surrounding his hometown of Lovelock. By 1911, the first excavation of Lovelock Cave would begin. John Reed obtained this account from the miners seeking commercial gain. We drove a small tunnel into the mouth of the cave, or rather to one side of it, the natural opening being too small to work through. I recall many boas or ropes of fine feathers. As these lay strewn about in the open end of the cave in the way of the workmen, they were irreparably damaged. In the north central part of the cave, about four feet deep, was a striking looking body of a man six feet six inches tall. His body was mummified and his hair distinctly red. There was a grass rope about his neck with a knot under the left ear. The rope was about eight feet long. The feet were bound together from the ankle to above the knees with stout rope. The mummification was complete, except for a part of the abdomen. 
The other mummies all had red hair. I think there were either four or five. Those that appeared to be women were small, something like a Japanese woman in height. Shortly after these accounts, the University of Berkeley, California would get involved and the most extensive excavations would begin, led by L.L. Loud and M.R. Harrington. During this time, Harrington writes, Many of the finer specimens eventually met with a similar fate. Perfect spear thrower, or at Laddell, went to a private collector in California and at his death was lost. The best specimen of the adult mummies was boiled and destroyed by a local fraternal lodge which wanted the skeleton for initiation purposes. After this madness had ceased and then the professional excavation thereafter, no giant bones were reported by Loud or Harrington. However, the same could not be said for the reports of others in the area, who would continue to claim giant with their various findings and conclusions over the next near 100 years. Do it. Can't do it anymore. <laughs> no. <laughs> uh. Look over here. Hmm. It's cold. So like with the other cave, we went to the hidden cave and like with several other caves around this area, these were used in the early 1900s to harvest guano or whatever it's called, the bat poop essentially. It's used to make fertilizer and other things. So that's why they were looking for it. Some of the burn marks here, they would use tires to smoke these places out. So all the sudden, and everything rose to the top. That's what I believe it is anyway. Is Amelia already in? Already in the cave. <laughs> so outside of bat guano, there were also 20,000 artifacts unearthed from this cave, consisting of sandals, a bunch of duck decoys, which like with hunting today, they're used to set out so you can draw other birds into land and then you can hunt them that way. So as we're standing in here, there's a sort of dead feeling. It's the best way I can describe it. I mean, it's just deathly silent in here. There were 60 bodies discovered, not giants. There was a six foot six skeleton that was unearthed. If you consider that a giant, maybe not by today's standards, nevertheless, giant story is still intriguing. There's a lot of publications throughout America of various above average height skeletons. Where they are today, if they even were around, we can't know, but we do know there were some official articles written back in the day, the early 19, 1800s. So this site was another example of a not permanent encampment from what archeologists can tell, but it's another storehouse as tribes would pass through here, this was a safe place to keep anything they'd need for ongoing hunting missions and so on. 
Many northern Paiutes say there's much more to the story than this. Among the traditions of our people is one of a small tribe of barbarians who used to live along the Humboldt River. It was many hundred years ago. They used to allay my people and kill and eat them. They would dig large holes in our trails at night. And if any of our people traveled at night, which they did, for they were afraid of these barbarous people, they would oftentimes fall into these holes. That tribe would even eat their own dead. Yes, they would even come and dig up our dead after they were buried and would carry them off and eat them. Now and then, they would come and make war on my people. They would fight, and as fast as they killed one another on either side, the women would carry off those who were killed. My people say they were very brave. When they were fighting, they would jump up in the air after the arrows that went over their heads and shoot the same arrows back again. My people took some of them into their families, but could not make them like themselves. So at last, they made war on them. This war lasted a long time. Their number was about 2,600. The war lasted some three years. My people killed them in great numbers, and what few were left went into the thick bush. My people set the bush on fire. This was right above the Humboldt Lake. Then they went to work and made tule or bulrush boats and went into the Humboldt Lake. They could not live there very long without fire. They were nearly starving. My people were watching them all around the lake and would kill them as fast as they would come on land. At last, one night, they all landed on the east side of the lake and went into a cave near the mountains. It was a most horrible place for my people watched at the mouth of the cave and would kill them as they came out to get water. My people would ask them if they would like to be like us and not eat people like coyotes or beasts. They talked the same language, but they would not give up. At last, my people were tired, and they went to work and gathered wood and began to fill up the mouth of the cave. Then the poor fools began to pull the wood inside till the cave was full. At last, my people set it on fire. At the same time, they cried out to them, Will you give up and be like men and not eat people like beasts? Say quick, we will put out the fire. No answer came from them. My people said they thought the cave must be very deep, far into the mountain. They had never seen the cave, nor known it was there until then. They called out to them as loud as they could, Will you give up? Say so, or you will all die. But no answer came. Then they all left the place. In ten days some went back to see if the fire had gone out. They went back to my third or fifth great-grandfather and told him, they must all be dead. There was such a horrible smell. This tribe was called People Eaters. And after my people had killed them all, the people around us called us Seidukara. It means conqueror. It also means enemy. I do not know how we came by the name of Paiutes. It is not an Indian word. I think it is misinterpreted. Sometimes we are called pine nut eaters for we are the only tribe that lives in the country where pine nuts grow. My people say that the tribe we exterminated had reddish hair. I have some of their hair, which has been handed down from father to son. I have a dress which has been in our family a great many years, trimmed with this reddish hair. I'm going to wear it sometime when I lecture. It is called the morning dress, and no one has such a dress but my family. It is just dead silent in here. Even in nature, you know, as quiet as it may be, you at least hear the wind, the animals. There's just nothing in here, being a cave, of course, but definitely the fact that there were over 60 bodies discovered here, it adds to the eeriness. The site of a tribal war, a place for storage and burial, a giant slayer, a home, a mine, a museum, another video. This is Love Lock Cave. Exploring out here, it's made me realize the sheer size of this earth, especially in North America. I mean, to think that. Back in the day, nobody had cars. They didn't have horses over here for a while. They had to go everywhere on foot. You can 
can see out here the endless expanse. Something to really take in. No. Maybe we owe him and ask the directions. Do you know where it? That is it. Oh, oh shit, shit, shit. Ow, ow. And I was just trying to ask directions. <laughs> just wanted to get directions. Yeah. <laughs> just wanted directions. <laughs> 